Hi, Julie. Thanks so much for coming on the Arthritis Life podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited just to talk about all things arthritis and life and yeah, get into it with you. Awesome. Can you start by just giving a brief introduction to yourself, like where you live and maybe something fun about yourself? Sure. Okay. So um, I'm Julie Croner. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I have two little children, uh, Emmy, who's three, and Wesley, who is eight months today. And um, oh man, what I, well, I'm living with psoriatic arthritis. What's something fun? Oh, geez. I don't even know. My life is filled with Coco Melon or Disney these days. <laughs> when I met a new therapist that I was going to see as a therapist, I'm like, what are some of your hobbies? And I remember literally saying, I like playing Legos like <laughs> with my two-year-old. <laughs> that is fun. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess that's my hobby. I couldn't even think Talk of anything else. So yeah, <laughs> I think that's a mom thing. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but oh my yeah. gosh, no. Yeah. And I always like to start with people's diagnosis journey because yeah. it, it is usually um, dramatic, interesting <laughs> and, yeah. and instructive for others. <laughs> so how did you get diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis? Oh, geez. Well, um, take you back to fifth grade. Wow. And, um, I started having a lot of knee problems. So my, um, my parents took me to an orthopedic and they looked, you know, looked at my knee and they were like, Oh, you know, your meniscus looks like it's ripped, flipped and separated from the bone. Maybe it was born like that. Maybe you just did it through dancing and softball, you know, let's do surgery. So I had surgery in fifth grade. Um, and then after that, every year I just seemed to have something like I was in physical therapy or I was on crutches or I had a knee brace and just, it, again, the orthopedic was just like, oh, this is a one-off issue. You're growing, things like that. Um, but by the time I was really into middle school and was still having these issues, the doctor was like, okay, maybe you should go see a rheumatologist. So I went to see one and they were like, eh, we don't know if there's anything wrong with you. I went to see another one and they said, you probably have psoriatic arthritis, but there's no definitive test. And I mean, I was in middle school, this is early nineties. So biologics weren't indicated for juvenile use yet. So they were like, there's really nothing that we could put you on. We could treat it as flare up as it comes, you know, whatever. So we left the doctor's office and my mom thought, okay, you know, she probably has psoriatic arthritis. And I being a little kid was like, I don't have arthritis. I'm not a grandma. Like this is not, no, this is not a thing. And we didn't have Google to go and like see all about what or uh, you know psoriatic arthritis was. So I I feel like we, I lived in denial for years and years of, of this. And I remember just having so many fights with my mom, where I would have issues. I'd be like, oh, I can't run the mile in gym because my knee's swollen. And she'd be like, well, it's because you have psoriatic arthritis. And I'd be like, I do not have arthritis. Like so many screaming matches. I have since since then apologized, but I just you know back then you couldn't tell me what to do. So. As the years went on, I would have one-off issues um, and it didn't, you know, I ended up having two more surgeries in high school and then college, I had a little bit of a reprieve, but once I graduated college and was um, working, I was traveling every, every week um, as an IT consultant, my knee started blowing up again, like it was really swollen. And then it came all the way up into my SI joint. And then, you know, I just remember walking through the Atlanta airport and if anyone's been to the Atlanta airport, it's huge. So like going from terminal A to E every, every Monday and Friday, it was just, I, I cried. Like I was in so much pain. It was just so bad. So went back to the doctor, ended up having two more surgeries again, thinking they're like one off things. By the end of that year, I was in the hospital, um, so inflamed. A my rheumatologist now, I met her that that hospital say she came in and she was like, no, you definitely have psoriatic arthritis. Like we got to get this under control. So technically I started thinking that my diagnosis happened when I was 27, but way back when, you know, a doctor said you probably have it. And I lived in denial for so many years. <laughs> Well, and that's so common because especially as a child, we have this kind of idea that, oh, you, you get an owie or you get hurt and then it gets better or you have a right. surgery and then you recover like, and that's so fascinating that you actually got the diagnosis in middle school, but then it didn't really get followed through. Like, did any of the surgeons yeah. later on know that you had that diagnosis? I'm just curious. Well, so I did go all those surgeries that I've had, I've gone to two different orthos. Um, and the one in the beginning, I, I don't talk to anymore, but the one who did my, my most recent ones, 
he was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that does make sense. That makes sense. You know, and kind of was just like, yeah, whatever. Okay. Like wrote it off. Yeah, I, I since have stopped going to him because I'm like, I don't really just want to have a yearly knee surgery for a <laughs> chronic inflammation issue. What is interesting though, is my mom is an amazing woman and she kept a binder on my life from basically the first health doc, like appointment that I had as a baby up until, um, you know, the end of, well, actually probably for forever. I mean, it's a huge binder. So whenever I, whenever I started looking at, um, you know, my life, it was a connect the dots of, okay, yes, this is systemic chronic, like infl- inflammation. This is a hundred percent psoriatic arthritis. So um, if you go back and kind of look at the history of my health journey, it's a perfect picture of, of PSA. Wow. And it, it, that illustrates how often it all becomes clear in retrospect, Yeah, but yep. in the moment it's hard to see those dots. And did yep. you have skin symptoms at all? Yeah. So it's, that is really funny because I would go to the dermatologist for what now I realize this psoriasis around my scalp line and like in my hair and they kept misdiagnosing it as like fungus. They kept saying, Oh, you have fungus on your head. Oh, like, but like, I always kept getting it. And now it's like, uh, hello. Like I had, sorry, I have had psoriasis. And so psoriasis hasn't been a huge uh, symptom that I've had with my PSA. Probably the worst I've had. It was actually during my first pregnancy. I had some on my, my chest and on my arms and a few spots on my leg, but mostly I just get it up in my scalp and like, or like behind my ears. But yeah, so if you look in my binder, it, I definitely went several times and it was always misdiagnosed, which is crazy. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. And I, I want to make sure I get the, the chronological, I want to finish the chronology. Yeah. So then when yeah, you, yeah. you got the knee surgeries again after college, and then you went back to the rheumatologist and we're like, okay, now we're going to attack this. Yeah. As sorry, I yeah. arthritis. What do you mind sharing, like your treatment plan or how that's sure. Been going? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, at the time that I got my, you know, what I kind of deem as my official um, diagnosis, I was also having a few other issues as well. So, um, the biggest one was avascular necrosis. So, part of my femur bone died in two places in my left leg. So it was causing so much pain, which then ended up, um, starting into complex regional pain syndrome on the left side of my body. So I had like a ton of different things going on. And back then I thought the avascular necrosis or AVN was the biggest issue because again, I didn't understand all of the the components at play. So I kept going looking for answers, but every doctor didn't want to touch me because my body was so inflamed because of the psoriatic arthritis. So it really wasn't until, um, I started talking to patients online and finding out what they were doing to manage their chronic inflammation that I started on this healing journey because every, my rheumatologist put me on the traditional, you know, methotrexate and then Humira and, um, you know, and then every you know pain meds and, and this medication and this medication. And I was on like nine different medications and two injections. So it, it, I, I just, every time I went, I would get more medication. But once I started connecting with um, people on Twitter and on Instagram and Facebook, I started realizing that, Oh, these people are doing diet changes. They're doing lifestyle changes. Like what can I do to help manage my symptoms? So this was back in 2013 and I went and I, I went to the library and I checked out all of these like anti-inflammation cookbooks and diet books and just trying to like do all my research. Um, and then me being the consultant that I am, I made this ridiculous Excel spreadsheet and I tracked everything. Like when I, what I ate, all the ingredients, how I was feeling, who I talked to my mood, if I left the house, if I, when I took my medication, what medications I took, like literally everything. So I tracked for six months. And at the end of that, I had all of these bar graphs and pie charts and like all of this amazing data on myself that I ended up printing out and like taking to all my doctors. And you should have seen the look on their face because they're like, what is wrong with this lady? But no, that's the best thing, right? Like it was, it it, 
it honestly was the best thing that I've done in my life because it helped me identify my triggers and what really causes my body to be inflamed. So at the same time, I was on medication, which was really helping. So I was really, all these changes I were making was helping, helping my body, like support even the medication to make it more effective. So, um, for me, I have found my diet is like the number one thing that causes me issues. Like if I I keep such a strict diet and people are like, how do you do that? I'm like, honestly, if I don't, I can't get up the next day or my hands hurt so bad or my back is like aching ridiculously. So it's, it's my body's so sensitive. So I figured out exactly my food triggers. I figured out, you know, that gentle movement with yoga and things like that really help keep my joints moving and keep, keep me going, keep my energy up. Um, and I, I realized that meditation and mindfulness is something I have to have in my, in my day to day to keep my nervous system in check. Cause if that starts to spike, then I start to feel anxiety and then, my, and then the pain creeps in and, you know, I just get overwhelmed. Um, so I, you know, with figuring out my triggers, that is primarily how I manage my psoriatic arthritis. Now I've gone on and off medications throughout the years. I've been on different ones, you know, every so often I have to try different things. Maybe I go into physical therapy to like get me going. Um, or, you know, I've done occupational therapy for my hands, which was like game changer. I loved that. You know, I I just feel like really good sense of what my body needs and wants and being, being tapped into that helps me manage. That's so, so helpful. And I think that what's key about that is that you researched all these different like diets and stuff. And then you looked at your own body and your own data. And I think this is where people get stuck because, you know, a lot of times people think, what's the answer? Like, what's the diet? What's the diet for rheumatoid arthritis? What's the diet for psoriatic? And, and there are so many different triggers that are unique to each person. Right. Right. Right, so like right. I, I've been gluten-free for over a decade. It has not made any difference on my rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, my rheumatoid arthritis has been everything from complete unmedicated remission to I'm on now three different medications and, you know, but it really helps my gut health and, or right. my, and my, my, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And I'm, I get recurrent SIBO, like small intestine bacteria overgrowth mm-hmm. cause I have gastroparesis. So it really, really helps just my overall sense of like well being and I know it helps my inflammation, but it just doesn't seem to correlate at all with my actual like joint pain, you know? So that's my, for me, gluten isn't the thing, but for someone else, gluten is totally their main trigger, right? Exactly. Exactly. I know. And I get so many people that are like, what's the diet I should follow. And they're really, there's not a one size fits all. I think, I think there are things that people should avoid overall just for better health and like, you know, sustaining our bodies. But when it comes to triggers with our autoimmune issues. I think everyone is so unique. Okay. I know the audience is going to want to know, like what are maybe like your top three worst inflammation triggers? So I definitely stay away from dairy. Like that's like huge, um, red meat. I mean, if I have a little bit of red meat, my joints are swollen. Um, and then I, I like to say that I don't eat grains, um, but I will be honest with you. I cheat with gluten-free grains. So I definitely can't have gluten. Like that is a huge no-no for me, but I have found even eating rice and oats and things like that, it does uh, impact my fatigue level. And also then if I eat more of it, then I start to feel it in my hands and my back. Um, but I do cheat and I eat like gluten-free cupcakes and cookies. And especially now having little kids like that, honestly, that's why lately I've been having a lot of pain and I know it's because I've been eating that kind of stuff. It's hard to, it's It's so hard. You have to have (laughs) an overall kind of quality of life balance too. It's kind of like with exercise some days, like you think, okay, going on this hike with my family, I know I'm going to pay for it tomorrow, but this is more this is, right. this is enjoyable to me in the moment. And I'm valuing that over the pain. So maybe the That's cupcake true. could be the same thing. I'm valuing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah. And I want to step back and, and think about, like, you mentioned that you didn't really come to terms with, or sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You, no. When you started connecting to other patients on social media, you started kind of understanding 
what the yeah. disease is more and all the plethora of options available. Yeah. And then when did you decide to start sharing your journey? So no, I totally agree. You definitely weren't putting words in my mouth because I, that is exactly it. I mean, I, I didn't understand all of this until I started connecting with other, other patients. And um, so in December, 2012 is when I had the hospital say that like got me my diagnosis. And then um, into 2013 for six, good six months, I laid in bed. I didn't put any weight on my left leg because of my AVN. It was just, it, it was a very depressing time. I mean, I honestly, it, it was bad. Um, my parents were like, okay, we need to get you out of this funk. Like you got to do something. So they ended up uh, saying like, Hey, let's go on, on a trip. I love to travel. And I didn't even want to go because I was having such bad anxiety and panic attacks, even going to the doctors, just because my inflammation was causing just like so much in my body. So I didn't even want to go on this trip, but they forced me to go. And I'm so glad they did because we went to Florida and I, we ended up going to Disney world for two days. Um, and I had always loved to sing like growing up. I always sang, it was just like my release and probably the biggest thing that brought me joy. Um, and I had always wanted to go to the American Idol experience at Hollywood studios. So we get down there and I'm like, Oh, we got to do this. We got to do this. And my parents were like, you want to do this? Like you didn't even want to come on vacation, but having all these panic attacks. I'm like, yes, I want to do this. So we're standing in line. I'm like, shit, like, what am I doing? Like I've been laying in bed for the last six months. Like what? So I auditioned and I get cast in one of the shows during that day. So I I'm like, Oh my God, this is so cool. Like they do your makeup, they get you all ready. You practice, you go up, I went up on stage and like the fake Brian Seacrest is like, all right, now Julie, like come up on stage. So I come up and I crutch out and I'm standing there with my crutches singing. And it was just like, Oh my gosh. Like I spent the last six months in bed, so depressed thinking that like my life was over, but you know what? It's not like I can still live this amazing life. I can still do these things that I want to. They may look a little bit different, but I, you know, I'm not going to let this define me. So I ended up winning that show and I went to the finals and I didn't win that final show, but I walked away with so much more than a golden ticket that day. Like I, I walked away with knowing like, you know what, this sucks, but you can make something out of this. So the next day, um, we were actually sitting on the beach and I thought, all right, through what have I learned over these last six months? And, you know, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot of patience. And, and I've also learned that connecting with all these other patients online really helped me feel less alone um, and helped me start on this path of healing. It was right then in that moment, I was like, I'm going to start a blog. I'm going to start sharing my story. And I came up with that. It's just a bad day, not a bad life, because it's like I had a string of really bad days, but it didn't mean I had this bad life. I could still do these amazing things. Um, so I came back from that trip and I started my blog. And um, from there, it kind of just snowballed. Like I, I, it started as just like this healing therapy of getting my story out there to connecting with others. And then you know, I'm someone who can't just do one thing. I have to do all of the things. So like I started seeing all these other people doing stuff and I just started inserting myself in conversations and going to conferences. And, and then I realized like this could be my full-time career. So I was actually on disability for almost four years. And whenever I started to become well enough to get back to working, I thought well, I could go back to IT consulting or I could really focus on this as a, as a career path. And I mean, that that decision was super easy. Um, so the, the reason that I started doing this really, I feel like it was something that I was always meant to do. Um, and you know, along my journey just brought me to this point. That is so incredible. And I, the metaphor of like, you know, if you can't, if you can't dance, sing kind of thing, like you, yeah. know, if you, you can't, there are a lot of things that we can't do because of our conditions. Right. And we don't right. want to just pretend those aren't there, but then focusing on what you can do. That is just, thank you to your parents for taking you to right, Disneyland, I know. Disney World. <laughs> we have never talked before, by the way, for the audience. <laughs> but I feel like we're like in this like total similar wavelength. Okay. Let's operationalize this. I'm not an IT consultant. I just like that word. <laughs> but um, so what are you doing now? I know you're working with, we or working for WeGo yeah. Health. What is that? Yes. 
Yes. So whenever I started trying to interject myself into all these conversations, I went out and I was like, okay, what companies are helping to raise the patient voice and get them collaborating with companies? And WeGo Health was someone that I identified and I started working with them while I was on disability. Um, they had sent me to a few conferences. I did a few um, opportunities with them. So whenever I was getting off disability, I reached out to them and I was like, hey, do you have any job openings? Um, and they actually were hiring at the time. So I like seamlessly moved over to there and, it, and it's just been such an amazing experience. So before I, I worked there, I was very much in the psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, you know, auto, autoimmune arthritis community, but moving into my role at WeGo Health, I now work with all condition area advocates. And I will tell you, I didn't realize how important and beneficial it is to kind of step outside of your own condition area bubble and see what other people are doing and, and learn from them and collaborate with them. Um, so, you know, I, I started this journey as a psoriatic arthritis advocate, and I'm, and I'm still very much in that space as much as my, my life allows me to be. But I, I do feel like this higher calling to be an advocate for all advocates and help them collaborate with companies who want their insights, who want to collaborate, who want to listen to what the community needs and wants. So at WeGo Health, we're a network of patient leaders, and we consider someone a patient leader um, who is using their health story or the story of a loved ones to really go out there and make change. Um, and we connect them with healthcare companies who are looking for their insights uh, or they want to collaborate with them. So a couple, like just to give you a couple examples, one would be, say, for instance, we're working with um, a company that has an RA treatment and they want to know about the RA community, we'll pull in, you know, say 10 RA patient leaders and we'll have an insights group and we'll talk about the community's needs and wants and things like that. So we do a lot of that. And then we also um, utilize patient leaders in creative. So say for instance, we're still working for that RA brand, you know, instead of seeing a commercial with an actor running through a field of daisies, you know, we feature you and you, you know, in that commercial, are you talking about your, ex your experience? So, um, you know, we really want to bring the patient voice to the forefront and make sure that anybody who has anything to do with these conditions are really collaborating and listening to the, the people who are on the front line. That's so important. And I know that people have such strong feelings about those yeah, commercials it's true. With, it's true. with actors and <laughs> everyone. I mean, this is why I'm even doing this podcast. We all just, when we get this diagnosis or when we have a new stage in our health journey, we want to just know, we want to connect to somebody who's been there, right? Like yep. who's been on this medication or who's dealt with this before. So I, I love that. And you know, in general, I know that both you and I are like big advocates for sharing their stories. Why do you think yeah. it's so important to, for patients to share their stories if they feel comfortable? Yeah. Well, it, and that's such a good thing. It's, you know, you have to feel comfortable in doing so, but if you do, even if you impact one person, think of how much you can impact them. So I'll give you an example. So with my avascular necrosis, so put, just a reminder, part of my femur bone was dead in two places. I went to, to over 29 different providers. No one was giving me answers. I mean, they would say, oh, I know what it is, but I don't know how to treat it. And I don't really know where to send you. So I felt so hopeless in what I was going to do. It wasn't until I saw people online sharing their MRI films of the stem cell procedure that they did that I found the answer that I that I was looking for. I ended up going and having the stem cell procedure done. I can now walk. Like I couldn't walk for three and a half years. I now can walk. I'm off opioids that I lived on for all this pain. You know, I honestly didn't think I would be able to walk down the aisle at my wedding or be able to, you know, walk with extra weight of having a child, you know, and now I've done that twice. And had those people not been sharing their story online, I may not have found that stem cell procedure that got me back to literally walking. Um, so it's just, you know, when you share your story, it, whether it's just on your Instagram, sharing your, your journey of going to doctor's offices, or if it's like a full blown, you're writing a blog or you're doing a podcast, um, you know, you're making others feel less alone. You're giving them more information than you may have had when you were in their shoes. And you're just helping push forward, um, you know, a different future for others who, who receive this diagnosis. 
That's so true. And yeah, I remember when I got my diagnosis at age 21, this is in 2003. And, you know, there were, maybe there were rudimentary blogs back then, but nothing was easy. Like you couldn't just right. sign up on WordPress or something. And I certainly didn't even think to look for other patients online. Right. It just wasn't part of the norm. Facebook didn't even exist right. yet. So yeah, yeah, this, the fact that we have this tool of online connection is just incredible. It is, it is. And I'm, you know, there's so much information out there online. And I think there's so many patient leaders out there who feel charged to go and comb through that information and find the best information to share out to the community. So I feel like patients sharing their story are doing, are filling such a gap that is needed for other patients and caregivers. Hi everyone. I'm interrupting really quickly to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by the Rheumatoid Arthritis Roadmap. It's a comprehensive online education and support program that I created from scratch to help people learn how to live a full life despite rheumatoid arthritis. In the course, you get to learn how to manage everything from physical symptoms like pain and fatigue to social and emotional aspects of living with rheumatoid arthritis. I even cover the logistics of things like how to track symptoms and how to advocate for yourself in medical appointments. To learn more, go to myarthritislife.net. So you mentioned your wedding. I, I know a lot of patients newly diagnosed are like, oh my gosh, if they're single, you know, like, how is this going to affect my yeah. dating, my yeah. future? How Do you mind sharing a little bit yeah. how, you, how you met Absolutely. your spouse? And yeah. <laughs> so um, whenever I was on disability, I was dating a long term boyfriend and we ended up breaking up when I was on disability. Um, and I thought, you know, oh, my world is over. Like, you know, like, how am I going to find some, I couldn't walk. I was on crutches and I wasn't sure I was ever going to be able to walk again. And then I had these issues. I couldn't even work. And I'm like, how am I going to find somebody? Um, and I ended up going on all the dating sites, you know, match.com. And, and I just remember back then, trying to put on this front of like who I used to be instead of who I was right in that moment. Oh, I, I, you know, I used to work for this IT consulting company. I used to travel the world. I used to do this and used to do that. And, you know, I'd meet all these people and a lot of them would say, Oh, you're on disability. Like, I don't want to deal with it. And, you know, it was crushing at that time, but it was better in the end. Right. But I, I remember meeting my now husband it was, it was like a month after I actually had gotten my stem cell procedure. And he's the first one that called me out on it. He was like, you talk as if you used to be great. And the person that I see is really great. Like everything you're doing is so impactful. And actually I wrote a whole blog about it. Cause he was like, oh man, like, you know, all your advocacy work, you're always doing all these really cool things. Like, why do you, why do you talk about that you used to be great? And it was really then that I was like, wow you know, you're right. Like I, you know, I keep putting on this front that you can still live this great life. But in my back of my mind, I kept thinking that I used to be great trying to find a partner to like do life with. Um, wow. So it was just really kind of get chills thinking about it. Cause it, it, you know, he just, he was the first person that really understood it and made me feel worthy of, of all of this. Yeah. So we, you know, we ended up getting married. We have two kids now and it, it was a journey to find someone, but <laughs> yeah. he called me out on my BS. <laughs> that is so important too, because I think that one of the dynamics that can come up in a relationship where one partner has a disability or a health condition is that you can kind of get this eggshells phenomenon where the person doesn't feel like comfortable. The person who's not having a health condition feels like, oh, I can't say anything or I don't want to, I don't want to call yeah. him out. And I, I'm, I've had the same thing with my husband at times. I, I started having panic attacks as well after yeah. I'd been in this car accident and I was going to therapy and, and all that was helpful. But at a certain point he was kind of like, um, I was having these panic attacks, like getting on the airplane and he was kind of mm. like, well, you have a choice. Like you don't have to come like, you know, and it was kind of like that. I needed that tough love to be like, like, he's like literally just come or don't come. Sometimes you really do. Yeah. Need that. Someone yeah. to call you out. And then how did your condition affect your like family planning? Just those yeah. conversations with your spouse. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I mean, whenever I was on disability, I kept thinking, how am I going to have kids? Like, how's this going to happen? Could I even have kids? And, and actually the first medication, the first biologic I was on, I didn't understand them at the time. I didn't know the, 
you know, all of the things that could happen on a, on a biologic. And I remember my dad asking the doctor, like, is this going to impact her having family in, in the future? And I really appreciate him asking that, that in hindsight, because I wasn't thinking about that at the time. Um, so, you know, these are all concerns that I had. Well, so jo I meet Josh and Josh is in the army and Josh is my husband and he's in the army and he, um, was actually getting deployed and we we're still dating and he left, um, like on a Friday and a week and a week and a half later, I found out I was pregnant, like shocker, wasn't planning this at all. Right. So I'm excited, but I'm nervous. Like what he's leaving for a year to be deployed. So he ended up, um, they had like three or four days before they were actually going to leave the country. He came home. We got married at the courthouse. We got to have a sonogram, like an early sonogram. And then he left. So he left and I'm by myself. I'm newly pregnant. This was not in the plan. And I'm like, Oh my God, like so many emotions, right? Like, okay. I didn't even think I was getting married, but now I'm like newly married. He's gone. But also am I going to even be able to be healthy enough to do this? Like I had just gotten back to working. I just gotten back to life. So honestly, I hate to admit this, but for the first few months, I wasn't really even that excited because I was more nervous. Like I was, mm -hmm. am I going to be able to breastfeed or, you know, am I going to be on medication and breastfeeding? Is the baby going to have the medication? Like what, like so many different things. So if you actually go and look at the time I was writing for health central, and I'm pretty sure I wrote a million articles about that because it was just overwhelming. Um, well, and the, and the research back, I mean, the research has exploded in the safety it has. of medication it has, yes. for pregnancy and breastfeeding, but even yet yeah, my son's seven years old. And I remember back then they were kind of like, Ooh, get off your biologics, but now yep. they're like, stay on your biologics. you know, exactly. So, yeah. It is, it's changed so much. And, and at that time I, um, was on Otesla and I had signed up for a mother to baby study um, to, to give my, my data so that other people, whoever are in that situation in the future could know, Hey, you know, this is safe or, you know, but anyway, yeah, I, there were so many different, so many different emotions. And I feel like it, 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 it was kind of a good thing. Cause I feel like had I had all those thoughts before I actually got pregnant, I probably would have like psyched myself out from actually like going and doing it. But since I was thrown into it, um, it helped me process it more. So by the time I, I had her, Emmy. Um, it was, you know, I was definitely more on board with my feelings. I was like, you know what, this is going to play out the way it plays out. And if I have to take medication, I'm going to take medication. And you know, this is, there's so many other women that do it. During that time, I started connecting more on the, you know, pregnancy, mom life in chronic illness. And again, going and talking to other patients, there's so many out there who are talking about it, which is fantastic. And they made me feel so much more comfortable. Um, so, you know, by the time my second one came around, I, you know, I still had that worry, but it was definitely like, okay, I got through, I did it the first time. Like I can, I can do this again. And of course I have bad days, but I would have bad days even if I did, if I didn't have them. That's what I remind myself too. Did your condition go, did your PSA go into remission at all during pregnancy? So my first one, my PSA did except for in the first trimester, I had more psoriasis than I ever had before, but that was it. Um, my joints felt amazing. Like it was great. So, um, after she, after I had my first, I, you know, probably a year later, I started really feeling crappy again. And I was like, Oh man, I either need, cause I had stopped my medication at that point. I was like, I'm either going to have to start on another medication or I'll just get pregnant again and it'll go away. So I, I kept trying and I wasn't getting pregnant. And I thought, okay, I gave myself, I'm like, if I'm not pregnant by January, I'm going to have to get on something. Cause I was really feeling awful. So I got pregnant in December. So I was like, yes. Okay, cool. Second pregnancy. No, it did not go into remission. <laughs> My joints hurt. Like it was definitely a different scenario, you know, but it, it you know, it was manageable. I, the thing that stinks whenever you're pregnant, you, you can't be taking like pain meds and all of these other things. So whenever I would have a bad day, I literally would just rest and, you know, take the day off of work and just let my body do its thing. But yeah, it was two different experiences. <laughs>
when you are in the process of getting pregnant, if your disease isn't well controlled, you're less likely to go into remission right. during pregnancy. So these decisions are just, they're so, they're so difficult. And they are. I'm, yeah. Do you have any tips and tricks that helped you just manage like in the postpartum period or the, you know, baby period? Cause that's the part that was really hard for me. Like just everything from lifting the baby. And so of course, yeah. as an occupational therapist, I'm all about like the life hacks. Well, I think the biggest thing is being able to ask for help. Like, it seems like such a, like, yeah, just ask for help. But I mean, I think it's harder than that. Than that. Um, but I, you know, I'm so lucky that my mom is just such a phenomenal resource for me. She's always here. She's always helping me. Um, so I rely on her a lot. And actually my sister-in-law has ankylosing spondylitis. So she totally gets it. And she, yeah, yeah. whenever she had her babies, I mean, she had a really bad flare up. So, so she, you know, she'll come and visit and she helps as well. So I, you know, doing that and just, um, having things like planned out. So, you know, having my diaper stations and like the bottles all set up and just like everything. So if I'm not feeling well, I can just like go and run and grab them and I don't have to, you know, spend extra time doing things like that. And, um, you know, when it comes to myself, just realizing that I need to pace myself and, you know, I'd like to do it all, but I realized that I can't do it all. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's a lot of meditation and just like focusing, like Julie, you're doing the best that you can. And like, yeah, it's so important. There's yeah. There's something about autoimmune warriors that I've noticed. We tend to be like a um, ambitious kind of almost perfectionistic. A lot of times, maybe that's just a, I don't know, maybe that's just the people I know. It's almost like these diseases are here to sometimes to remind us that you are, even if I was totally hundred percent able-bodied, I remind myself all the time, like you would still need to sleep. You know, yeah. you would still right. need to re- oh, like yeah. you know, literally Definitely. only have 24 hours a day. Cause sometimes it's easy to get in that trap of like, oh, I'd be a better mom if I wasn't, if, if I didn't have this, you know, no, do you ever so struggle true. with those? Like, oh my gosh. Guilty thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. And so I, I've always been into meditation while well, I say always, the, you know, the, since 2013, when I really started like managing my condition and I always used Headspace, um, the app. But recently, um, I've been using this mindful mamas app and it's been so helpful because every meditation is just about motherhood and like getting rid of those thoughts. And that's actually been super, super helpful for me because that is something that I've definitely been struggling with. I mean, I have one child, so I've, I've heard and and witnessed in my friend group, the transition from one to two is a lot. (laughs) You know, I, it was a lot. I will say I've been blessed. West, my second is so chill. I mean, at least now he's eight months. So we'll see what happens once he, you know, starts running around here, but he, he has made it a lot easier because he has, he just kind of is just like going with the flow and we'll sit there and just smile. (laughs) It's so nice. That's so sweet. Oh my gosh. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say about just your journey with, um, pregnancy and, and motherhood with PSA? Whenever I think about like, uh, the stereotypical mom, it's like, Oh, you know, she has snacks in her bag and she has things planned out. And, you know, I feel like being able to tap into that and kind of plan ahead does really help in these situations. So, you know, just always knowing there are some frozen dinners in the freezer for when I'm feeling crappy um, or, you know, some, you know, having some extra coloring books or something that are new that whenever I'm not feeling well, I can pull out and like, you know, get them kind of just like sitting by themselves. I feel like being, being on top of those things, planning ahead, kind of knowing your limits and your triggers are so, so important. So like I, now I'm so glad that I did the work back before this to know my limitations, um, because that helps me on a daily basis to, to be able to show up and be here. I love that. And yet having that plan ahead of time, I think for me to deescalates those thoughts when you're like, yeah. Oh no, what if it gets worse? Or what if I have a huge player? Like, Oh, I already prepared for that. So yeah, yeah. it deescalates. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and then I always like to ask, do you have any yeah. advice for newly diagnosed patients? Yes. My biggest tip that I always tell people, um, is just 
be empower yourself and be a driver in your health. Um, you know, in the beginning, I relied so much on the doctors to tell me what to do, where to go, what to take. And, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't rely on them because they are a wealth of knowledge, but we need to take responsibility for our health, um, and be the part, be a partner with them. So do your research, connect with other patients, see what they're doing. Um, you know, what they're doing is might not totally correlate to that what's going to be your your solution but that's information you can go back and talk to your doctor about so I, I think just the biggest piece of advice is empower yourself and be a driver in your own health I love that and it really goes along with the model of like in, in occupational therapy and in healthcare we call it like self-management like anyone mm-hmm. with a chronic illness is like the manager of their yeah. health experience right like you're the CEO like your doctor is somebody you see 20 minutes every few months. The CEO does not spend only 20 minutes. You're the right. CEO living with it 24 seven. So finding that balance, I think one of the things that I get, I see patients get really overwhelmed with when they try to though, do their own research is how do you evaluate which sources are high quality versus right. not? Cause the downside of social media proliferation and, and not just social media, but it's just the ability to connect to others online has been unfortunately people who prey on the vulnerable Mm, with miracle mm -hmm. cures that don't work. And yeah. Do you have any advice on that? Or is it just awareness was the first step? (laughs) Well, no, and it's a great question. And I feel like this comes up so, so often. I, I always tell people don't just go and find someone random and then take what they say as Bible. Like if, if you're, if you see them online, follow them, like learn their story, see what they're posting, how they're connecting with other people. And I feel like you can then get a really good gut instinct of like, is this person legit or not? And then, you know, don't just take what they're doing and just go incorporate it with into your life. Go talk to your doctor about it because they can then kind of to flesh out knowing your specific case, like, is that going to help you? Is that not going to help you? So you know, in doing your research, I think you have to say, okay, you know, I talked to this person and I got this story, but you know, what other pieces of the puzzle can I, can I get as well? Now with Facebook groups, there's so many people like chiming in and, and giving their opinion and sharing their experience that I feel like you can get a really well-rounded experience because someone will be like, oh, I took this miracle drug, but then like 10 people will be like, yeah, that's scam, that's scam, that's scam. So, so I feel like Facebook groups are really good because there's a lot of conversation happening there. Yeah. The only caveat I add to Facebook groups is to remember that there's a self-selected population that goes into them. Cause like when I was in medicated yeah. remission, I was on Enbrel methotrexate for, and in total medicated remission for five years. Like I had zero symptoms oh, of rheumatoid great. arthritis. And so I didn't go in a group because right. I didn't, I wasn't didn't need it. I didn't yeah. need to process it. I was just doing right. fine. You know, so remembering that those it's a selection of people who I would say, arguably they're usually the ones that are dealing with more challenges from their disease, whether that's the, right. you know, something's not working great for them. But at the same time, you're right that, that having ex- access to like the rich variety of stories. So we can see the people who are able yeah. to, you know, these people use the diet, these people went on keto, these did vegan. And it, it kind of reminds you that there is no one way, right. You know, right, 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 um, right. And I, I love seeing when people kind of um, weed out the miracle things too, because oh, yeah. like, okay, good. I really loved your point about talking to your doctor about why certain things work for certain people. Cause like they can mm-hmm. explain to you like, well, okay. The reason this person was able to control their disease with only, let's say only sulfasalazine or something is that like their disease was mild and like yours is right. severe. So you might need right. more severe and just exactly. getting that conversation going, even though you might have the same diagnosis as someone else, you might have a totally different severity. Yep. Great. I just, I love talking about this because it's, it's really most patients, like primary source of information mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. other, other patients online. So, yeah. So is there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up? You know, if you're dealing with an autoimmune arthritis, any autoimmune condition, just know you're not alone. Um, there are thousands of us out there and, you know, it, some days the world seems so tough and hard, but that's just one day. And just because you have a bad day doesn't mean you have a bad life. And when, when you really kind of zoom out and look at it in totality, um, you know, pick, pick those small moments and small wins for your day to really focus your energy on, um, 
and you can, you know, you can still live that amazing life that you want to. I love that. I, I love the name of your website. And so I will definitely <laughs> be including all the links you mentioned to, you know, mindful mamas. I really want to check that yes. out and yeah. Rego health and I will include in links to your blog, of course, in the show notes, but thank you so much for your time. Oh my gosh. Thank um, you. Yay. I can't wait to share this with everyone. 